Welcome back to the Nutra Medical Report. We have Jonathan Gray all the way from tomorrow, literally, so he should know more than us. He usually does, actually. Uh, he's done such amazing research. I have to say he's one of the gifted people of our time, bringing ancient archaeology, proving that the Bible repeatedly is true, archaeologically and scientifically, and proving things like today in Chapter 36. We're going to talk about the proof, not the conjecture, of the resurrection, which is the basis for the Christian church, the basis for our faith. <clears throat> as, as Paul said, without the resurrection, there is no basis for our faith. So, um, Jonathan, we're in Chapter 36 of The Forbidden Secret. Let's proceed. Yes. Dr. Bill, I think that there's so much... Uh, there's two or three uh, broadcasts of this, but we'll we get started today with some of the objections and uh, get rid of those first, and then we'll go into the evidence subsequently. How does that suit? Sounds perfect. Uh, let's do it. Okay. Now, um, some years ago, there were two bright young men. They were skeptics. They went to Oxford. One was Gilbert West, who became a very eminent uh, public figure later in life, and the other was Lord Littleton, the famous English journalist. Both these men wanted to destroy Christianity, and their conclusion was that to destroy it, they had to do two things. One, they must prove that Jesus never rose from the tomb, and two, they must prove that Saul of Tarsus, uh, who was a hired assassin and killer, a very anti-Christian figure, was never converted to Christianity. Now, Gilbert West took the job of uh, proving, disproving the resurrection, and Littleton uh, set himself the task of disproving the experience of Saul. They gave themselves about 12 months, and then they came back again at the end of 12 months. Now, uh, West, in his investigation, um, Took, a, took first of all the line that Jesus actually never died and that he had taken a narcotic drug that fooled the Romans. Now, he, he, gave, he gave himself a time to, to prove this or disprove it. And as he began to go into the evidence, it became obvious that he had made a little bit of an error here. Um, and so he eventually took on the idea that Jesus had gone into a swoon. Now, I'd like to deal with both these, Dr. Bill, for a moment before we go any further. Yeah, absolutely. Because Let's we go, do hear you... these arguments today from skeptics. Yeah, exactly, yeah. And we do know this, that if, if there was no resurrection of Jesus Christ, if he didn't really die and rise again, then Christianity is a farce. And uh, none of us have any hope of eternal life at all through him, because he's still in the grave himself. However, um, if, if he did die and did rise again, then uh, the foundation for Christianity is absolutely uh, unmovable. Now, uh, West looked into the question of whether there was a narcotic drug involved in this where Jesus took and this fooled the Romans and they thought he was dead. And now... The idea of a narcotic drug to induce conscious unconsciousness on the cross, uh, the fact is, this is an absolute fact, it's incompatible with the very nature of crucifixion. Now, in crucifixion, the arms were spread out, and the hanging body raised the ribcage and dropped the diaphragm to the maximum. And this meant that the victim can breathe only by raising the body. And this required the use of the large muscles of the legs uh, if this was to be maintained for any length of time. And, and this, of course, accounts for why the legs of those who were crucified were broken to hasten death. Because death by suffocation would follow within minutes if they couldn't raise their legs to keep on breathing. So your thesis basically is that if he was narcotized so he would avoid death or swoon, he would have died immediately. He would have died immediately because he would not be conscious to um, to uh, raise his his uh, diaphragm in order to keep breathing, and just in a few minutes he'd be dead anyway. And it would not have taken a spear thrust to hasten his death. He would have been dead before his friends could have taken him down. So the whole idea falls apart on the fact that you need to be conscious in order to keep on breathing on the cross. Now the the other idea was that. Um, 
he was in a swoon. Well, the very fact of being in a swoon would, would mean that the same result would be uh, would be covering. Now, the argument uh, that also comes up with sceptics is that um, after the Bible says that after Jesus was laid in the tomb, they prepared spices and ointment and brought these to the tomb. Now, the argument is, the objection is, if Jesus was dead, then what were the ointments for? Because a dead body doesn't need medical treatment. Okay. Now, the fact is that it was a Jewish custom. It, it is a practice related to, to embalming a, a dead body. And uh, we do have the record that Jesus' own mother and others with her had actually seen him die, and they were not coming to treat a, de a sick man at the tomb. And I'd like to just raise this fact. When a person's been beaten <clears throat> and whipped until he's so exhausted, he literally collapses on the public streets, and somebody has to take his cross. When he's been up one day and all one night and part of another being buffeted about, kicked, spit upon, when he's been without food or water, lashed with an inch of his life, and finally have spikes driven through his hands and feet to hang in the blazing sun for hours, and then have a huge spear plunged into his side with great spurts of gushing blood and fluids pouring out from his body, when his lifeless, limp body has been taken down from the stake, carefully wrapped in grave clothes, and laid away in a tomb, my question would be to any honest, intelligent, thinking person, could there be any question that he was dead? Right, and not only that, by the way, the spear thing, I had uh, one of our anatomists years ago explain this, when the spear was thrust at the angle from the spear destiny, it not only went through the stomach, it actually pierced the pericardium in the heart, which is why it was a mixture of blood and water, water from the, the stomach and blood from the heart. And what it would happen is you'd end up with what's called a cardiac tamponade, where the blood in the pericardium would cause uh, an increase in amount of blood around the heart, and it would cause a very rapid onset over a number of minutes or hours of death. Absolutely right, yes. <clears throat> it, it's impossible that he was not dead. Now... Uh, just suppose we take the line a little bit longer that uh, he was only wounded, just as a, such a remote chance. <laughs> yeah, right. He's got uh, a spear right through his stomach and his heart, and he's just going to be wounded. <laughs> he, he's just going to get down yeah. and and just go have it, you know, go over and have some fish from uh, the Zedekiah and uh, Fish Company, right? <laughs> yeah, and St. Peter's fish, though, right? And, and, and yeah. once he has, once he chows down, he'll be fine, and he can go off to India, like some of the fools who try to say that there was a Jesus of Tiana that went all the way to India and taught in yeah, the area yeah. of Kashmir, which is ridiculousness. There, by Absolutely. the way, there were hundreds of quote Jesus named uh, so-called uh, holy men, which were not Jesus Christ of Bethlehem. These are all kinds of Jesuses. It was a common name, yes. Yeah, it was like Jesus here in, in, in Mexico. Yes, that's right. Now, it, just suppose there was a remote chance, Bill, that Jesus wasn't dead. Now, tell me, how could he ever, in such a horribly wounded condition, weak and exhausted, from inside the tomb, remove a huge stone to escape the, the, the tomb, a stone which required several soldiers in, an, in their youth and strength to move? Yeah, it was actually in a groove, and the stone was estimated around two and a half to three tons. It was a big, big stone. It was a heavy stone. Yeah, yeah. It was, it was the height of a man, and it was about a foot and a half across in a groove that was rolled across the front of the cave, and it took three or four soldiers with levers and and, and long poles to actually move the stone to get it in place. Amazing. Yeah. Remarkable story. We come back much more. You may want to get this book, The Forbidden Secrets. Many more amazing books available at ebooks from. For us, B E F O R E U S dot com, for us dot com. Back with Jonathan Gray, who's on twice a month. Back in a moment. Now, when a lot of population of the earth, uh, as we approach the end of the end, uh young, healthy, elderly, etc. 
are going to face a, uh, a time where it's not the end of the world, but for them it will be. Uh, we're ending up with a time where, you know, devastation on the planet is coming. And I don't like to be a negative person, but, you know, with the hope of the resurrection, with the hope of God caring for his people in the midst of disaster, uh, we have this hope that, it, that exceeds the uh, catastrophes, if you're honest with yourself, that are coming up on the whole earth. Yeah, that's right. Okay, now just as we mentioned just before the break, Bill, um, suppose there could have been a remote chance that Jesus wasn't dead, that he might actually had swooned or something and, and that he had been put in the tomb. However could such a horribly wounded man, weak and exhausted, remove such a huge stone which required several people to, to move on their own, in their youth and their strength? Now remember, the Jews had carefully guarded against such a possibility. They'd gone to Pilate the governor and they'd said, Sir, we remember that that deceiver said while he was yet alive, and this shows that they firmly believed he was dead, after three days I will rise again. Command therefore that the sepulchre be made sure until the third day, and let his disciples come by night and steal him away and say to the people he's risen from the dead, and so that last error shall be worse than the first. Right, so in other, well, he, had a, he had a guard, in other words, set over the sepulchre to make sure that they couldn't steal a body and try to say that he was raised from the dead. Absolutely. Yep. They secured it from the outside. <clears throat> right. And By the way, that stone could only be moved from the outside, too. Jesus could not remove it from the inside. It had to be removed by the outside. And they had to take out the, the peg, one of the pegs, before they could, they could roll it to the side. Right. And the peg was on the outside, and it was established and secured by a Roman seal. Right. And they had watch, a watchman there waiting and ready. Now, when the stone was rolled back, it was not done by secretive men by night or by a wounded man from the inside, but by a powerful heavenly being. And the guards who had been set to guard the tomb literally fainted at the sight of them. And it was not a secret thing that happened. It was a tremendous, awesome, glorious event. Now, okay, uh, furthermore, uh, let's take another angle on, on a man who had not, suppose he had not died. It's impossible that a man who had stolen half dead out of the grave, suppose it did get opened, and he crept about weak and ill, still wanting medical treatment, which he would have, who required bandaging, strengthening, and care. It's impossible that he could have given the disciples, who were absolutely devastated, suddenly the impression that he was alive and had conquered death and that this was going to be the beginning of their new work, which changed their sadness into enthusiasm and worship. That's absolutely an impossible uh, possibility. <laughs> I call it, call it an impossible yeah, possibility. In other words, but if, you, if you look at the behavior of the people, the disciples and the apostles and the disciples after his death, you can only explain their behavior by a resurrection. Yeah, absolutely. Now, it's interesting that uh, Josephus, uh, the first century contemporary who was not a Christian, had written something concerning Jesus. And I'm raising him for a reason, which I'll, I'll give in a moment. And he says this. This is what he says in his Antiquities of the Jews. Now, there was about this time Jesus, and when Pilate, at the suggestion of the principal men among us, had condemned him to the cross, those that loved him at the first did not forsake him, for he appeared to them alive again the third day, and the tribe of Christians so named from him are not extinct to this day. Now, I'd like to make two comments about this. Lest people say that Josephus, uh, first of all, um, is not reliable as a historian, he's recognized as the most diligent and greatest lover of truth and very, very accurate and, and typical of the accuracy tests which he's passed. Uh, we could mention the Sada events. Uh, an extensive archaeological excavation of, of Masada, the Jewish fortress uh, near the Dead Sea, was completed in 1965, and uh, the new Encyclopedia Britannica states this, the descriptions of the Roman Jewish historian Josephus, until then the only detailed source of Masada's history, were found to be extremely accurate. Yeah, Just in other words, he would be, he would be like... Scholars to be a very accurate historian. 
I guess in, in nowadays, if you talk about modern media, you call them the no-spin zone. Uh, he just called it the way it was. He didn't, journalists will be twisted to the left or the right. He didn't say a pro-Roman thing. He just described what he actually saw. Absolutely right, yes. Now, uh, th- there may be people who will suggest that um, the text of Josephus has been altered by Christians or something like that to put Jesus rising the third day. Now, let me say this. How are we going to regard another version of Josephus that's originally been found, discovered not among Christians, but among Arabs who are anti-Christian? Right. And this was beyond the control of any alleged Christian forgers. And this 4th century Arabic text it says exactly the same thing. I have a copy of it in front of me. It says that Pilate condemned him to be crucified and to die, and those who had become his disciples did not abandon his discipleship, they reported that he had appeared to them three days after his crucifixion and that he was alive. Accordingly, he was perhaps the Messiah concerning whom the prophets recounted wonders. And that's Josephus talking, and that's an Arabic translation of Josephus, which never was touched by Christians and was discovered only recently. Yeah, that's pretty amazing, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, it's important to, to, for that to be known in case there's anybody listening who thinks, well, OK, Josephus, we can't rely on what he says. He was a contemporary. He, as you said, he just wrote it as it was, as he saw it. Yeah. OK. Now, the argument has been raised, and, and uh, I'm, I feel that we must address this, that, um, OK, three days after the crucifixion, the tomb was empty. The Romans acknowledge it. The Jews acknowledged it, the followers of Jesus all checked it and admitted that the tomb was empty. Okay, the objection comes up. Perhaps they went to the wrong tomb. Those women who came on Sunday morning and reported the tomb as it was empty must have gone to the wrong tomb. But then the question arises, how could three or more people so soon forget the place where they had laid a loved one just a, a, three days earlier. I mean, after all, they had seen exactly which tomb the body was laid in because they themselves had put it there. Now, in any case, would not Jesus' enemies soon have found the right tomb and exposed those deluded women and other followers of Jesus who said he was risen? Now, we know that this was the private tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. And Joseph of Arimathea was there at taking a lead in depositing the body in his own tomb. Now, could this learned and, and wealthy man so quickly forget the location of his own donated tomb? Oh, come on. But, but there's a worse problem to this idea, and that is that the Jewish chief priests and elders never questioned, never questioned that the tomb was empty and that they had the right tomb. Amazing. Again, uh, history and the documents and the uh, even the secular journalists prove it and further proof of the resurrection. Back in a moment. Welcome back, and uh, Jonathan, let's continue. Uh, it's actually an area that's a, a point of contention among a lot of different faiths. Uh, but what people should understand is that the facts speak for themselves. Uh, some of the transcendent nature of God, which I know is circumscribed by many different denominations, they think that there's a, a true, complete split between the personalities of the of the Father, Jesus, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, when I really believe it's like three different versions of the same element of omniscience, omnipotence, and eternal and all love. In other words, there's no love in the universe except love that flows in this, initially from the river of God. Uh, no love between husband and wife, the love of many, which is the agape love. Uh, there is no love of the world. <clears throat> There's no love of any other beings, unless that love originally comes from the Creator. And when Jesus came, he was literally the Father in the flesh. And I want to repeat that because I asked people, I said, well, then what spirit did Jesus have? Did he have a soul? And people said, well, that's strange. You, know, you mean he was soulless? Of course not. If you had the Holy Spirit, then basically he is the Holy Spirit and Jesus literally uh, presenting to us and that means that he's, quote, two-thirds of the Trinity, but in actual fact, he is the Father in the flesh. He said, though you see me, you're seeing the Father. So what Jesus himself claimed was, I'm not a prophet, alone. 
I'm not a, uh, a good teacher of, of uh, morality. I'm God, and I'm here to tell you that I'm God, and I'm going to demonstrate a, a principle of God that even though I lay down my flesh for three days to pay for your sin, which reconcile us, that I'm actually going to raise it up in three days like I'm going to raise up this uh, destroyed temple. And uh, I believe that we have had, uh, in the third day, which is the third millennium, which is happening now, we're entering the third millennium, God is going to raise up his, uh, his temple, which is the bodies of all the believers. Uh, a lot of people have kind of like a knowledge about Jesus. I'm sure the devil can quote scriptures, but they don't have a knowledge of him deep in what I call their spiritual DNA. They don't understand in a, in a real sense of, of eternal hope that there is no hope unless there's a resurrection. There is no hope unless there's an eternal one that cares and loves for you, that beyond your parents and your grandparents would may have loved you or not loved you or, or abused you, a world that's uh, full of evil, that there's an eternal one that cares beyond all of this stuff. There's just really no hope unless there is a loving God. And uh, a lot of times people try to portray God as a as the big man in the sky with a fly swatter and we're the fly, and he's always trying to find a reason so he can destroy us or cast us into the lake of fire, and that's not the nature of the Creator. It just isn't. Yes. Well, um, and, and on this question of the wrong turn, though, Bill, um, more problematic for the wrong term idea was the Jewish chief priests and elders never questioned that that, that was the right term and that it was empty. Yeah, they never now, questioned it did it in their own writings, right? No, they never questioned it. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, this objection has been raised. Somebody must have moved the body to another location afterwards. The term is empty, sure, but somebody must have moved the body to another location. Maybe Joseph of Arimathea changed his mind and removed the body of Jesus, and so the tomb was empty. Right, now, my answer to that is this. If that were true, then why did the guards who were on duty not say so? Why guard the tomb if they knew the body had been moved to another spot? It would have had to be shifted before the stone was rolled over because they couldn't do it once the, once the seal and the stone was in place. And if it was empty before they put the stone in place, it would obviously be seen to be empty by those who sealed the door. Now, also, it would have been a simple story for the soldiers to tell if Joseph had simply moved the body earlier. In fact, a much safer story as far as the soldiers were concerned because it was there was a penalty of death upon any soldiers on duty who would allow anything to uh, be interrupted, taken away or stolen. Right, so and they told we, the truth. In other words, they they knew that there was no interruption. And by the way, I'd heard the story that was passed through the early Christian church that some of the Roman soldiers that actually guarded the tomb and were witnesses to the resurrection became Christians. I, I would not be surprised at that. Yeah. Uh, it, it would really be an overpowering experience. Yeah. Now, here's a question. Why would Joseph even have tried to move the body so quickly after, at great risk to himself and his future popularity, he begged the body to have the body placed in his own tomb? Uh, he, why would he want to move it after it had been placed there? Right. And of course, he made no such explanation to the disciples who now fully believe that Jesus was risen from the dead, and they're told that Joseph was an honorable man who was also waiting for the kingdom of God, a just right. man. Now, would a man of this caliber and character perpetrate a fraud? I think not. And if there'd be any trickery, sooner or later it would have been exposed. All right? Then the argument comes up. The Roman soldiers maybe had a chance to hide the body secretly and bury it somewhere else at a later time. But as I suggested a moment ago, that's very unlikely. Military law would demand the death penalty upon soldiers who lost their prisoner. We have right. documentation that proves that was the custom. And the fear of punishments produced faultless attention to duty especially on the watches overnight. Well, the reason why the but Roman why soldiers in Rome were so powerful... Death, and what would be their motive for removing the body? No, no. Exactly. The, the Roman soldiers are so well trained. That's why they crushed all the empires around them. Uh, now, if you look at the Roman soldier, the average Roman soldier was like five foot two to five foot three, very well trained, very well equipped. When they came into places like the British Isles, they were dealing with giants, people that were six foot tall or taller. 
The reason why they were conquering them is because their army was so well trained, so well equipped, and so cohesive. They would form a phalanx. They, they were basically uh, like a machine. And uh, these soldiers are so well trained. Like, let's put it this way the Roman soldier was equivalent right now to our SEAL Force 6. We're not talking about average trained military. Their training techniques were, were, were stellar. And so if they're given a command, they, you don't hear of any reports of, of the kind of thing you hear even in the modern military where you have you know, insubordination and so on. These things were dealt with with immediate, swift, and permanent punishment or death. Yeah, that's how it was. Now, another objection comes up, okay, if the disciples could not steal the body, if... Um, if the Roman soldiers did not steal the body, if if uh, it changed the, its location, if Joseph of Arimathea didn't do it, well, maybe the Jewish leaders hated Jesus so much that they stole the body and secretly buried it in another location. And that's oh, right. why it was never found. Okay, you know, skeptics hang on like a bulldog, and but we've, we've got to knock this off because we've got to get to the truth. Uh, the Jewish leaders steal the body. I suggest no, it doesn't make sense. On many different occasions, they tried to have Jesus, or Yeshua, killed. That's the religious leaders. In fact, I found in the Gospels 11 attempts on his life during his ministry. But the scripture keeps on saying, but his time had not yet come. Now, they were jealous of his influence and character. They would have done anything to discredit Jesus as the Messiah. Yet even when he was in the tomb, there was something about the prophecies that bothered them. Firstly, their own scriptures predicted the anticipated Messiah. And secondly, in Jesus' life, these prophecies one by one had been claimed to be coming true. And one of the prophecies hinted that the Messiah was to come alive again after a violent death. That's Isaiah 53. And Jesus had claimed that he would die and rise again after three days. So... To make sure that Jesus' body could not be snatched from the tomb, the Jewish leaders had themselves called upon Roman help to keep that body in the tomb. And at their own suggestion and under their supervision, the tomb was sealed. And so well was it sealed that no one could break it open and the Roman guards were ordered to watch it. Okay. Now, the third day after the crucifixion, what a morning that was. We see several Roman soldiers running toward the city, and according to witnesses, they're very frightened, and as they run by frantically, they cry, he's alive, the dead man's alive, and as they pass the council chambers, the Sanhedrin chambers, several priests step out and bring them inside. Now, my question is this. Why did the soldiers go into the council chamber telling one story, and come out telling quite another. Amazing. Now, we'll go into that again in a moment. Welcome back, and uh, people say, why is this important? Well, we, tell you, we don't tell you what to believe. We don't tell you what to, what we do want you to do. If you check out the facts, and you ask better questions, just like these questions, the questions are raised by the Sanhedrin, by people who wanted to, to dissuade people to say, no, there was no such thing as a resurrection. It couldn't happen. It's unscientific, etc. Guess what? The God of the universe isn't bound by the, quote, laws of physics of man. Uh, he's not bound by them. Uh, he can supersede them. He can transcend them. That's why we talk about miracles. And, uh, you know, miracles happen. Um, you know, every day uh, I use the gifts that, uh, that God's given me to try to help discern people's medical uh, wellness issues, and it first exceeds my medical talents, which people know, are, you know God has blessed me to be a good doctor, uh, but I use my gift of medical discernment, and that's a miracle. It's another sign gift to say that what I'm saying otherwise, when I bring on amazing guests like Jonathan Gray, uh, you need to pay attention to, because despite talking about things like, you know, near space events and economies and everything else, if we don't have a faith in Jesus and the resurrection, uh, where is your faith placed? Your faith is placed on men, like Obama, who just got a, you know, re inaugurated. Uh, basically, he should be on his way to impeachment, which we're going to talk about tomorrow with Hardy Schlanger. But without the resurrection, uh, your face is vain. It's a vain idea of a foolish mind. 
Yes. Uh, without him being raised, there's no hope of any of us being raised. Right. Well, in other words, it's like John, I called it, then just become a John Lennonite. You know, you believe that, you know, imagine there's no heaven and no hell. Imagine there's no, uh, you know, life after death. And everybody li- lives a wonderful life just because we're otherwise mortal beings being mo- being moral. Well, that's, that's a logical inconsistency. Mortal beings by themselves will always do the wrong thing. Yeah. Always. In fact, the definition of good is to hear and do the will of the Most High God through prayer, through scripture, and through fellowship. Uh, and evil is anything other than that, even if it looks good. And the problem is people don't like that definition because no matter what, quote, religion you believe, or if you're an agnostic or atheist, they don't understand that without a personal relationship with the Most High God, you're only capable of evil. Um, <clears throat> I remember this when I spoke at a church uh, down in uh, Des Moines, Iowa, and one of the people uh, that came up to the, to the at the end of the three and a half hour talk said, "Dr. Deagle, um, I want to get you know receive the most high." So I laid on hands and prayed for each one of them. And uh, this man was a big man; he was six five, six six, with a big lumberjack jacket. And he started jumping around and praising God. And all of a sudden, this horrible, fine voice came out of him. And uh, six men had to jump and pin him to the ground because he was snapping at them, trying to bite them and everything. And I put my hands on either side, and I, of course, working in an emergency, I got my fingers turned in so he wouldn't bite off a finger. And I prayed, and God said, uh, they said to me, no, pray for this guy. I said, I don't know what to say. I was praying to God. And, and uh, he said, you're an evil man, Dr. Deagle. And uh, God said, I agree with him, but I'm covered by the blood of the Most High God. In other words, no one is capable of evil without the Spirit of God in them and the direction from the Spirit of the Most High God. We are only capable of evil continually. And anybody who thinks that it's not a continual fight every day to renew that is a fool. And that's why Paul said, even if I return and teach you another gospel, don't believe it, because he even said the gospel is eternal. And if I change and teach you another gospel, don't buy it. In other words, uh, walk with God is a walk with God. And uh, one of the great heresies of the modern church is that once saved, always saved. And the fact is, it's a walk with the Most High. You can only stop doing potentially evil when the physical body is dead and you're now fused with the Most High God at the end event of your life, which is your soul and the Spirit of the Most High become fused as one being and you're now a son or daughter of the Most High and you're no longer capable of doing your own will rather than the will of God. And that's a hard thing for people to accept because they they want to accept, they want to think, well, I went through this, I had my salvation experience. Uh, Everybody's a sinner, whether it's overt, covert, or just through ignorance. There's nobody walking the face of the earth, no matter how holy they are, even if they're doing miracles, that is not a sinner. Uh, But what Jesus looks on is the intention of the heart, and people need to grasp that. This is why the church is losing so many people, because they don't teach the real gospel of Jesus, which is the, the... the church is a intensive care unit, a hospital. It is a place for sinners. As I like to say, there's a sign that says sinners going up toward the Most High God and sinners going down. And we're not qualitatively different. The only thing that makes us different is the blood of Jesus, period. Anything else is foolish ego. Yep, absolutely true. Foolish ego. Now, and we want to think we're better, and we're not. And that's what Jesus is teaching in the resurrection is, his, uh, his death and resurrection, his blood is the only thing that makes us different. Period. Yep. Now, now the, record, the record in Matthew states that the angel came, his brightness threw the, the guards into, a, into a, a trauma, and uh, they saw him come out. Now, they came running into Jerusalem, and they reported to the chief priest the things that they had seen, <clears throat> and the record says that they were told by the Jewish leaders themselves, they were given money, <clears throat> they were bribed, and they were told, say the, you that his disciples came by night and stole him while you slept. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we'll persuade him and secure your safety. So they took the money, did as they were taught, and this saying is commonly reported among the Jews to this day. Now, mm. my question is, why were the soldiers so self-assured in confessing to sleeping on duty when the death penalty was mandatory for such an offence? Also, why were the Jewish leaders so anxious to make the soldiers change their story? Why did they, were they so willing to pay a large sum of money to the soldiers 
to spread the story that Jesus' disciples had stolen the body away. Now, if the Jews had stolen the body, why would they bribe, bribe the soldiers to say the disciples had done it? Now, here's a further question. What would have been one of the greatest proofs to the people that Jesus was not the Messiah and that he was still dead? Well, here's my answer. Surely, the finding and the exhibition of his body. Now, if the Jewish leaders or any of the Jews of Jesus' day had been able to find Jesus' body, suppose they'd taken it themselves and they could produce it, they would have produced it. I'd just like to throw in a little Absolutely, bit of yeah. history. Absolutely, that totally makes sense. Uh, and it yeah. also means that, and this is the other thing, the Jewish leaders never disputed any of the miracles of Jesus. They even tried to come up with a scheme saying he did it by the power of Beelzebub. Uh, so they didn't dispute the miracles. They just tried to say the source of it was he was a master of the demons, the king of the demons. So, yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> now uh, you go back to the end of World War Two. Just as the fickle Italian public dragged the body of Mussolini through the streets of Milan, and then they hung it in a public square upside down beside the body of his mistress. I guarantee that so would the Jews of Jesus' day have paraded Jesus' broken body through the streets of Jerusalem and all the other towns and villages around and displayed it publicly as proof for the world to see. You can count on that. Yeah. All the Jewish leaders had to do to destroy Christianity was to find and produce the body of Jesus and publicly display it. And that would have been the t most in important talking point right up to this year, today. Exactly. And if they'd stolen the body and they knew where the body was and they could produce the body, then why was it that these same Jews finally persecuted and even murdered yeah. at the jeopardy of their own lives in order to stop those who were going about preaching that Jesus was risen? And would it make any sense to take vows as they did to eat no food or drink no water till they'd killed the Christian Apostle Paul? Would it make any sense to kill James, the brother of John? Would it make any sense to martyr and butcher numerous other disciples and Christians for teaching Jesus was risen from the dead if all they had to do was produce the body of Jesus? I mean, a man would have to be a literal fool, Bill, wouldn't he, in the face of such compelling evidence, to believe the Jews stole and had Jesus' body, surely. All yeah, exactly. they had to do to disprove the resurrection story was to produce the dead body. There's no way the Jewish leaders stole Jesus' body. Absolutely. It's logically inconsistent. Now, we mentioned a few things that a lot of people, they ask frequently to post up on Clay and Iron the, the statement of faith. Well, you're hearing pieces here and there when we have Johnson Gray on and other issues. The real issue is what I'm teaching and what we are preaching here on this program is what Jesus taught when he walked the earth and the apostles. We're not teaching another gospel. We're teaching the original one, the way. The first three centuries of the church before it became Christianity, as uh, Domitian, the emperor, blasphemed and called Christians little anointed ones and called them Christians, or little anointed ones, when there's only one, the Father in the flesh, Yeshua HaMashiach. As I say, the only difference between those saved and unsaved is not your actions, but the blood of Jesus and the fact that he was resurrected. Everything else, on that, yes. everything else is foolish ego. Uh, your actions don't make you good enough for God. They just prove you have a relationship with him. Period. That's right. They're just evidence of that. that, that They're just evidence of the fact of what you, of that relationship existing. Take care and uh, back tomorrow.